soldering iron, soldering those microelectronic components. We do not. We import it. Isn't it a disgrace for a country which cannot do their thing? And I'm sure many of the students know how to do it. Why don't we do it? Okay. So, um, of course, the globally today, if we want to be a part of those 200, 300 universities, top universities, we must understand either innovate or evaporate. If you don't innovate, you are nobody. Nobody accepts you that. So if you want to compare with Singapore University is, is a very innovative one. Hong Kong University is very, they are very young university, but they are ahead of us, way ahead of us. But look at all the innovation they do, all the technology they have developed. Okay. So uh, Bill Gates also says here, this is the only way to eradicate poverty. If you want to eradicate poverty in this country, that's the only way to do that. Okay. And of course, as I said, the center of gravity of innovation is shifting eastward. I think the world has recognized that Indians have a fertile brain, very sharp. They work very hard. Anybody who goes to USA, I mean, they may not work hard here in India, but when they go to USA, they work 24 hours. I can assure you that. Okay. Okay. And, and that's why they are well respected. Okay. Okay. As I said, we have taken a lot of initiative. We understand now the, there's a need. And so we have, a, as I said, declare, we have declared a decade of innovation. We have set up a National Innovation Council and Foundation. Oh, we have National Science and Technology Development Board. We have TIFAC Technology Information Board. So we are good in it. Documents are there. Departments are there. Some of them are part of Department of Science and Technology. DST I call Department of Special Treatment. If you know somebody well, you can, you can rob them of crores of Department of Science and Technology. You can give a project at crores without any problem. But if you don't know that thing, you cannot even get a lack in, in few years. And I'm sure many of you must have seen that. I, I've sat in some of the committees and, I, and, and one of the unpleasant things I have to say is that this is not fair. Okay. So, uh, some IITs have now started courses on innovation. They, I think we are learning now. But, you know, I, I must admire one university at least in Kerala. Kerala is one university, I think, in the country which says we will give you credit for your course in innovation. So, it's a part of education. At least they have taken a lead. I, I okay. That this is as important as, as teaching you physics, chemistry, or humanities. Something. It's as, as important. Okay. Okay. So, of course, Gujarat uh, does, has done probably the best work today. It's called the Grassroot Innovation Network doing extremely well. I have studied their system and they have brought in innovation. When I say innovation, it doesn't mean to say you have to have a PhD or a B.Tech or M.Tech. It could be artisan also. But you have to work with the artisan. I mean, artisan says, okay, I can make a wheel this way or, 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 or an engine this way. Or, 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 you know, we talk of solar cells. Everybody talks of solar cells. You have a panel. It's an expensive panel. You want to get the maximum out of it. You want the best electronics to convert the DC into AC. You want the best way to use it in a battery. But more important is how do you put it on your, your roof? How do you make it cheap? How do you make it simple enough so they plug in? Well, the Indians don't believe in that. They only, we only buy, unfortunately, we're buying everything from China. In that so, um, but as I said, simply innovation is not enough. We have to also, uh, not many innovators incidentally become entrepreneurs. I, I think they are more interested in, 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 in showing something. This is where they are. Their, their life depends on, but uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to have um, entrepreneurship. So these two things go together. That's why I put innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, yes, we also recognize in this country we have research parts, we have science technology parts, we have now technology business incubators. But you know, uh, this has been going on for many years. I have been actually member of this national committee, but very difficult to convince anybody that we should go anymore. You know, the only institute in the country uh, 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 was IIT Kharagpur, where I set up the technology, was only. And nobody was prepared. Most of IIT said, this is not our business anyway. Um, we have only 13 science technology parts in our country. Israel, every university is mandated to have a science technology part. There are 55 technology parts. China has 650 technology parts. 650. They are parts especially for women and are Chinese, for example, for special sectors, okay. That tells you, that shows you, well. and these are the parts which, help, which are already, which are set up near the universities. The universities have no hesitation in using their innovative power to earn money. Honestly earn money based on knowledge, there is nothing wrong with it. In our country, unfortunately, we think the academics don't have business to make money. 
there's nothing wrong with it. And that's why a professor of MIT or, or Caltech, for example, is free. He can take out any days of the week. He says, I will not teach this week or I will not teach this course this semester. I will run a company. The only place in the country till about 10 years ago where faculty was allowed to set up company was IIT Kharagpur, which I allowed that. And I was threatened by the ministry that this is a wrong, improper and so on. I allowed my faculty, I allowed my to set up a company. Now, fortunately, all IITs are doing that now. I don't know whether this university, but please, for heaven's sake, this is as important as any educational system that you are thinking of, as, as important as any subject that you are. So, this should be considered as a domain of knowledge, entrepreneurship, or, or not. So, uh, we, we have only 13 parks, we have 60 uh, incubators, all IITs have incubators now, but half of these incubators are not working. And that also shows you how our sick our system is. You create these parks and so on, but half of them are working only. So we need to, to work on that. Okay. Um, why knowledge parks? Of course, the knowledge park is the one place where uh, you can try out our system. It's an ecosystem, obviously, where you can try out innovation and creativity. Uh, you can link them between research, development, production, management, because this is where all these facilities should be available. And in a way, it's a convergence of learning, R&D, and societal needs. And mind you, it creates a multiplier effect. I, I think I'll show you an example of one of the... Having said all that thing, in a way, you already know what inhibits creativity and innovation in our country. And uh, uh, you allow me to repeat that, because this must be repeated, this must be understood by particularly our senior people. First of all, visionary leadership and management, lack of crusaders. If we appoint our directors and vice chancellors and so on, who have no idea, we have a chairman of UGC has no idea beyond high school, then, well, you know, you cannot think of visionary leadership and management. There's a lack of initiative by institutions. Most institutions, as I said, when I set up, everybody told me, why are you, why are you destroying the IIT culture? Why IIT has to have a science technology park? Incidentally, I got a 100 acres science technology park. 100 acres I got free from all the people, nobody could, nobody could imagine, from Jyoti Basu. Well, you know, I convinced him, this will do good to your, to your state. And he gave me free 100 acres of land. Okay. So, we don't understand that. And we don't convince anybody. And, of course, our organization, our management, there is no flexibility. There is no pragmatic organization rules. You can always quote the rules, why should I lend my X-ray diffractometer or spectrophotometer or NMR? to an entrepreneur, he's going to make money. We always say he's going to make money. Well, it is not easy to make money. What is wrong with our national facility? You have NMRs and EPRs or whatever facilities you have, microtone. If, if, if an entrepreneur comes in and says, please, for heaven's sake, allow me to use. You know, this is what Israel does. Israel says, I give you five million dollars to any, any, any entrepreneur. Five million dollars. If you succeed, return it. If you don't, forget it. But all facilities of the university are available to you. One or three. So, I think, so, and there's no accountability. Of course, the word accountability does not exist in the dictionary of any Indian institution. Universities or IITs, no accountability. You can get away with anything you want. You can get any DST report, uh, a project, and put up a report, and today with multicolor printing, you can have a very beautiful photograph. And everybody does that. I can assure you one thing, because I've been involved in many committees here, including the Banagar Award committees here. They, nobody reads the word. They only go by name. They say, oh, this person is coming from this university and his professor is well known or his professor is in the committee. Well, he deserves a Bernagar Award. You know, Bernagar Award is a Nobel Prize of India. There was a time that it was very strict, but the situation has changed so much that here they look at, you are from North and there are members of the committee who are more, more important than North, they get a North. If it is South, they get a South. I'm telling you from experience, sitting in this, arguing with these people. So I think there is there's no accountability anywhere. And of course, there are no incentives. There are no incentives. Uh, you know, I allowed my faculty to, to set up companies and earn beyond their salary limit. That I was told the government of India doesn't allow it. I said, show me a rule. Nobody could show me the rule. So our, some of our, our teachers started earning more. Only thing was they had to pay 3% of whatever they earned back to the institute. And we earn money from that. Okay. My deputy director had a company. Okay. Um, and now the director of IIT Delhi, previous one, for example, had a company. And nobody stopped that. There's nothing wrong. All IIT, MIT professors, all Stanford professors have companies of their own. 
and they also teach and they are very well known teacher they are the nobel laureates many of the nobel laureates are coming from stanford and caltech but they also earn money this way so uh, there are no incentives there is no financial support and hand holding is not there anybody wants to use an instrument in, in a university he comes and he says oh well you know why don't you pay something i mean it's very foolish you have a spectrophotometer of 50 lakhs and uh, an x-ray diffractometer of 50 lakhs the fellow wants to do a sample or two and you want to charge him you are not going to recover that 60 lakhs we never think of that thing i think we should welcome such a person with open hand and say okay when you earn something please think of us come back and fortunately many of the iits are coming back now too they say we have earned enough now they are giving back to iits for example okay so we also don't understand what is the next technology transfer mean okay because we don't have the mechanism and these have to come from management people our humanities people for example okay okay so what sort of ecosystem do we want essentially whatever i said i will be a sort of repetition first is obviously we must change our attitude and mindset that innovation and entrepreneurship are integral part of our education integral part of our society our universities i think that has to percolate to students to the staff the faculty and so on and then we have to create a, a system where you can translate and uh, you are translated you should be given incentives and reward and don't wait for the convocation to give one award for the topper of this or topper that's okay but there can be also a person who is an innovator why not give him an award that's okay okay so and of course all our rules for sponsored projects consultancy every university every higher education institution should have total academic autonomy they should not be going back to the ministries either the state or the central to be asking can we do this can we do that thing they are the one they should have a simple enough rules for these consultancies interaction with the industries accepting money from the industries having industrial chairs and so on and we should have a liberal sharing of intellectual infrastructural sources please welcome anybody who is prepared to spend two or three lives of his years of his life on innovation because after all he is spending those years of life without knowing what the result would be we must encourage he is like a soldier fighting on the frontiers of 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 wherever the wars are he is also a soldier soldier of knowledge and we should respect them that way okay and of course we should establish uh, connections with industry we should involve them in in setting up our courses in our reviewing courses in our our reviewing our faculty members and our our projects and so on and uh, uh, have chairs sponsored by them uh, faculty companies should be this should be allowed once the iit is allowed there is no reason why iit with university cannot do that let uh, let let the faculty members set up the company instead of doing publishing paper let them do that that should be equivalence of that i have promoted a lot of people on the basis of, of their 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 patent for example i said you show me a good decent book of international level our publication our 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 product our process and indeed iit kharipur produced number of products during my time which can't see my students are physicists they become engineering physicists there are 14 of them have set up companies throughout the world here and they all say that is because we learned how to do things and how to do things which are useful to society and it was all basic physics but but they translated that basic physics okay so um hand holding provide generous tax benefits because we tell the government here that this is an investment in the future of our country here allow them if they make money here don't take away from them let them recycle that money okay and give them tax benefits okay then facilitate donations and and philanthropic uh and industry there are number of industries will, will be very happy to to give you money provided you have students and faculty want to do a project in their line or name one of the buildings after them you know if you are a state government or public public uh, central government the government does, by they say there are rules they don't allow you to name any building after somebody i have not seen the rule i have challenged them i said show me a rule because i was the first one called the school of management as vinod gupta school of management because he donated 5 million dollars okay and they said that's very wrong you should not have accepted 5 million dollars you will go to jail you did not receive the approval of the rbi i said i don't know of any rule i know only my board of governors as a i am concerned i am autonomous and if my board approves it that's the end of it they said no you will be in trouble i said well anyway i'm very happy to go back to iit delhi but i invited the president of india shankar dayal sharma to inaugurate i knew him through somebody else he agreed to come he laid the foundation stone he and i have laid the foundation stone of school of vinod gupta school of management thereafter the ministry said 
we cannot do anything now. Chopra, we cannot do anything. And, and this has allowed all IITs to do that. All IITs have School of Management today named after the donor. So, and you can do the same. I'm sure that you must have alumni who will be very happy. So please keep that in mind here. And of course, uh, um, donations are there, but I think we must respect people who give donations. There's no reason why we should not give them honorary degrees. Or respect them something. You know, honorary degree is an honor, all right? But if a person uh, comes in and says, I want to set up your lab, I want to help you people here, and does it on a substantial scale, why should we not encourage such a person? Why should we not reward such a person? We sh why should we not honor such a person? So um, this is a, essentially then provides strong and empowered leadership. Leadership is important. Vice chancellors are important. Directors are important. Please, whoever says you, so what does it matter? If you have a weak director, a weak vice chancellor, anybody knows that here, he pulls it down by, by a dozen years. And, and the other director comes and passes, it takes him another 10 years to, to, to pull it up. It takes. And I think this is what the government of India has not recognized. They still continue to appoint people. On, 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 they have their own ways of thinking. Okay. And that's very unfortunate. Okay. okay. So, um, very quickly, I, I think I've already said what is our problem with our, as I said, we have no accountability. I, I'll put a summarize in only very few words. What is our problem with the university, all universities? Central or state, even central. There is a zero accountability in any university. There is uh, the autonomy, uh, academic autonomy in most cases is limited only to one thing. What you teach, how you teach, and how you examine. At least that much universities in principle have unless something else happens here. But, but that's the problem. You have given them already that autonomy, but they say no, no other autonomy is there, therefore let the same teaching go on. Let the same IIT, same professors are teaching, uh, same thing for 10, 15, 20 years, the same, same courses. Delhi University has not changed the, you know, I'm a student of Delhi University. They were teaching MSc Physics, the same physics that we were taught in 50s, till the new vice chancellor came. And the poor vice chancellor got into trouble, he changed everything, but then they said, you know, he cannot have a four-year course and so on. So, as you know, the history of that thing, the poor fellow has to withdraw the whole thing. But that's where the, the problem is. So you need total autonomy, at least academic autonomy should be given by all states, by all central government. If you don't give financial autonomy, it should be given. And that can be given in a very simple form. You give, this is X amount of money is given to you. And now, you spend it wisely, as long as you have a governing body. But governing body does not mean a governor of a state becomes your chancellor or president becomes chancellor. What can a chancellor or a visitor like president of India? You know, there are 100 institutions today in India, central universities, IITs, IAN put together, 100. There are about 20, 25 vacancies every year. These vacancies are filled only by a committee which is chaired by the Minister of Human Resources Development. Imagine HRD minister chairing 25 such every year. And then imagine it going sent to the, the president who takes uh, two, three months. He says, what am I supposed to do? So the ministry feeds him. I mean, it's a most absurd system. What has the president to do with this whole thing? What has the chancellor to do with something? We have to be responsible. Those who are managing the universities, they have to be responsible. So there should be accountability. So I think this is really way, way. So, and of course, regulatory bodies are our, there's no doubt about it. The UGC, AICD have done a lot more damage to our education system. Everybody understand that. But not many people have the courage to speak out on that. Unfortunately, I don't have a problem. I'm, I'm 81 year old. I have no problem saying it. Of course, I've been saying it for a long time anyway. So, so they hear me. They embrace me like this. If I go to DSC secretary or MHRD secretary, he embraces me, have a cup of tea, choked us up. We will listen. We listen to you. We will think it over. Okay. You are a little too, too fast for us. This is what they say. But I think time has come when the young people should all stand up. We want to learn what we want to learn. We don't want to just start. We want to learn what we want. We want to use that learning to do something. I think that's where the time has come. So, um, um, the, I, I, this I lecture I gave recently, two weeks ago, on, on what ails higher education. So, uh, of course, there are other problems, undoubtedly. Nobody wants to become a teacher. Because you heard uh, Modi ji saying, it's not only primary school something, the universities are much worse. Professional education, you know, 94% of our engineers are coming from private, private institutions today. Private institutions, 80% uh, of their faculty was B.Tech teaching B.Tech. Ever heard of this? 
That's what the, the foreign governments, foreign institutions came and said, what the hell are you doing? B.Tech teaching, B.Tech, how can we accept your student for M.Tech degree in, 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 in MIT? How can we do that? And fortunately, after about seven years of struggling uh, by people like me, that we tell, told the government, for heaven's sake, stop this. Don't allow B.Tech teach B.Tech. Can you teach a B.Sc. teaching B.Sc.? Can you do that? So finally, they have come up to this, that, all right, M.Tech will teach now. Only M.Tech will teach. But then uh, we are a very clever nation. In all aspects, we are very... So we have devised a new technology, how to get M.Tech degrees. So you don't have to do anything. You just register with the next door college, and uh, you continue to teach, and they give you a degree, they put up a stamp, and, and so they get money to give it. Very common in Tamil Nadu, very common in Andhra Pradesh. I think they are the ones who really are famous for that. I, don't, I won't talk about your state here, but this is the problem. So we have devised a new degree. Of course, you can buy PhDs also. I mean, mind you, anybody wants a PhD, I think you get on the, yeah, the internet. A lot of people have got degrees like that. A lot of, you, you name a thesis you want, and uh, these fellows will go to BHU library or an IIT library, take out this thing and copy it and paste it and, and give you a thesis. Okay. So, um, but we have to, I think, the whole educational system has to be modified. There's no point in teaching, uh, whatever I understand here, your teachers are 24 hours, 25 hours teaching. It's absurd. No decent teacher can do research if he's teaching 24 hours a week. No can do that. I think it's high time to understand that we should teach what can be learned and not everything what the UGC says. So somebody has to struggle for that thing. So define your teaching. And fortunately, some institutions have started, and I'm chairing some of the committees in some of the NITs. You know, even IITs have 180 credits for a degree, B.Tech degree, 180, 190. Whereas MIT has 130 only. Same number of hours, uh, for each credit is three hours, but 190, how can you do that? Of course, when I was a professor at IIT Delhi in 1970, it used to be 220. It was so much. So everybody is just teaching all the time, teaching. Where do you do research? And they want us to be a, a global university among the 200. How can you do that whole thing? But fortunately, there are people who work 24 hours in spite of all this. But I think this university should also do the exercise. Every university should do the exercise. Teach what, what students want to learn. Teach what can be learned. Teach what can be translated. That's really where, where it should be okay. So, uh, and of course, uh, now of course, some of the best courses are available online, even, uh, even on time, in time, uh, available from IIT, from any university. So that problem is also simplified. So a teacher only has to learn, you know, so this is why all teachers should also go through, the, become students. They should also hear those lectures and then discuss with the students. They should become tutors and use the best lectures that are given, given by, by some of the top teachers throughout the world. They're, and they are available all free. And when I visited your library, great library, you have a fantastic library. It has to go to that. That it should be online teaching, what is called MOOCs, you know. Uh, this is the system we have to do. We say conventional teaching will not do anymore, okay. So, um, anytime, anywhere. I think that's the, that's the uh, slogan that people are talking about. Access, quality, equality and quality, anytime, anywhere. In fact, they say that all this, uh, you know, functions of the library, um, learning, there are four functions here. I mean, they are available on the cloud. They should be available on the cloud. You should have a cloud of your own here. And, and anybody comes with a tablet and you should be able to access that cloud and whatever like, visual, there are virtual experiments available and so on. And if he's excited, then he can go and do work with his own hands. So this is what higher education should be okay. Um, am I doing all right? No, I'm not. I, is it okay? An hour? I was given one hour. I was assured I'll be given one hour. Is it okay? I'm, is somebody more <laughs> uh, So how do we redesign higher education? I think uh, I put in a few words. Recently they asked us to make recommendations. Not that anybody is going to read that. I'm sure the government will not read it. But I said there should be a very major paradigmatic shift from government control of higher education to autonomous and accountable management. It should be people and educationists should get together. Society should get together. They should manage. The government doesn't know how to manage these things here. Wherever they have managed, they have made a mess of it. So there should be autonomy and autonomy should be an accountability with people from who are affected, our stakeholders, shareholders, whether they're industry people or, 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 or society. And 
this tinkering will not do. Even the present government is not thinking of tinkering. Our Minister uh, of Education, um, she hasn't cleared a, a 12th grade, but she talks well. And she is, I think this week she's called all the 40 central universities and their chancellors and vice chancellors together. And she wants them to tell them, tell her how to change higher education. No, imagine how the hell she is going to learn from that thing. She would, and, and, and autonomy is something they don't want to give. Autonomy has to be controlled by UGC. UGC tells you that if you pump, publish a paper in those open access journals where you copy, do you know that the, the largest number of people who plagiarist, plagiarist in the world are Chinese? And next, you can predict it, Indian, largest number. 60 to 70 percent of our publications in those open journals are all plagiarized. And unfortunately, UGC gives you grades, you give you points, and on those points, you are getting promotions. Okay, you are Some of you probably do. So you, I mean, I am a president of the Society for Scientific Values, and I get a lot of literature. The tragedy is that it's not just only you, it's our top scientists also involved in it. Top close up. Including our Bharat Ratna. Five papers have been plagiarized. Our Mashelkar, great man, great scientist. They are all my good friends. They all embrace me like that. He published a book on intellectual property right along with the foreign authors and several pages were copied from somebody else. Intellectual property right book copying from somebody else. <laughs> Imagine. So it's not, so, so, so the examples have to be set by these people. Okay. So I think uh, it's important that we have the accountability and academic at, at, um, accountability is important. And this process of promotions on the basis of publications and something is, is absurd. I think there should be unlimited number of positions. You should carry your position all the way to professor, senior professor, dean, whatever. But you should carry it with dignity, with what you have achieved, what you have done. And it is this really what should, what should give you the promotion, not, not the rules and regulations. This is what it should be. This is what IITs. See, IITs started very well. But IITs have reached a stage, I think most of you don't know that. Today, 50%, 50.5% is reservation. Imagine students coming to IIT, joining IIT, who have, who have marks in physics, chemistry, math, sometimes as, close, as low as zero or even minus. That is because the government of India says you must fill all the positions in IITs. To fill all the positions, well, if, the, if, since uh, the question papers are very tough, so you, you go down and down and down even to zero marks. The, the result is in the first year in all IITs and all NITs, there are about 30 to 40 percent failures in physics, mathematics, chemistry. And the government of India, direct, the minister has called director of IIT Delhi, this I know personally very well. He was banged. He said, how can they fail? This was a joint entrance examination. But he doesn't know that joint entrance examination, we have messed it up because of the government that you have to take students irrespective of how many marks they have. You have to fill it up. And so the poor director comes and shouts at the head of the physics department. So the head of the physics department says, okay, we'll give another paper. Everybody passes. Imagine happening in IITs. Where is the hope for other universities? I think this is where we are, we are destroying system. And also let's understand there yeah, that the government cannot provide institutions for, for, for training and teaching. And in, I think there, there's a need, obviously, private. As, as I said, 94% of our engineers are coming from private institutions today. But our job should be to make sure that they have a quality. That's all about it. And, but we should not be restricting them and, and putting them through all the controls and regulations. And... Uh, and uh, in doing so, all the regulations say, oh, so there's a bribery. Everybody has to put money. I, I have been chairman of committees going through God knows how many institutes in the country. I can assure you one thing. Almost all private institutions have paid money to be what they are. All. Whether the universities, the price of the university today, if you want a university in any state today, most pr likely price is 15 to 20 crores. You pay 20 crores, you can become a university. I can give you the prices also. So I, I think this is where we have destroyed the system here. So we, we should have a diversity, public, private, public-private, but all we want is a system, an autonomous system for accountability. Autonomous system, not a government system. Autonomous. And this is really what we should have. Okay. Am I allowed another 10 minutes? Is that okay? Hanji, am I allowed 10 more minutes? Is that okay? Uh, okay, I, I thought I'd give you a couple of examples, quick examples of what people have done. See. 
we have we have our own uh, uh, alumni who've done so great work in 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 in, in USA. Uh, and they say, this is a fellow, I think you have know the name, Guru Raj Deshpande, used to be about 14, 15 billion dollar thing. He, he gave only 17 or 18 million dollars to MIT. Look what he has done. Uh, it's very clear that in order to do this, you see, academic institution and uh, uh, industry on this side, uh, commercial end. In between there has to be some interface. And this is where entrepreneurship, this is where you hold your hands and so on. This is why you need incubators and technology parts, okay. He did that. He only gave 17. Look at what he's done. He's got, uh, he gave the grants here and I think there are some 30 companies, if I can read properly here. Uh, he, out of that have come some 30 or 30, 40 companies. Some, uh, some I think uh, at least 100 students, volunteers and some 200, if I'm, 200 faculty was involved. Very large number. I mean, they grabbed the idea that, that somebody is giving us money for an idea here. And they channel the, uh, the Deshpande, Gurdwai Deshpande has made a name for him. He is not the only one. But I just give you an example what how MITs have prospered and how they become good. I give another example. We all think of major universities like Cambridge and Oxford and say how great they are among the 200. Look at what 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 uh, Cambridge has done. I think maybe I have to, oh this is very difficult to put. Uh, you have to see the circles. Cambridge in 1960 was this tiny little thing, poor begging for money. We are not the only one poor in university, but they were also poor. Poor universities were also poor. 1960, you can see the circle there. And then, go from 60 to 70. They said, fine, on our campus will come companies. And they will work with us. And obviously, they will feed back. So, you see 60s, you can see number of companies. Then there is another circle, 70s. I hope this is clear now. 70s. Then the another circle, 80s. Then 90s. And now, to a, in the 2000, 2010, there are, there are around 200 companies near the campus of Cambridge and Cambridge is filthy rich today. Imagine company institutions like Princeton among the top. Princeton earns more money from these things than they need it. So every year they have a surplus and they put it back in bigger instruments, bigger equipment and so on. No wonder then they always go up. Princeton, Stanford, Caltech. MIT, they earn more money from these companies. And we say, why should we allow these companies? What a business have they got? To this, is, this is what, an example there is okay. Well, as I said, Stanford has, has done fantastic. You know, Silicon Valley today is a trillion dollar. We are a trillion dollar economy, our country. And yet, Silicon Valley, which has been created by Indians, Chinese, and, and Stanford. Indians, about 30, 40 percent. Chinese about 20-25 percent, rest is, is standard. It's a, over a trillion dollar technology. Same, technology, same GDP, one place produces more than, than our whole country put together. And ironically, one third of it is from the Indians, our own Indians. Okay, okay. just to tell that people always think, oh well, why do we mix science? Science is so pure. You know, at one time when uh, I was not a director, DST said, Chopra, why don't you set up a technology park? I said, by, by all means. But uh, we will give you all the money. But then uh, my director said, no, 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 no. IITs have no business with the industry. He, this is what he told me. This is in, in 70, early 70. But when I became a director, the first thing I did was set up a park, technology park, 100 acre park. Okay. I just thought I'd show you some of the Nobel laureates whom, whom I know, you know, they are in our areas. I mean, they, look at the number of patterns they have. I don't know whether, they, are we, is that clear enough? I don't know. I think it's not. So, you see, this is the fellow who did the, the conducting polymers, for example. 46 patents. Okay, the other co-author of his is 28 patents. So, it, it's not, I mean, even Einstein, I think a lot of the young people probably may not know. Do you know Einstein had one patent on refrigerators? Refrigerators. It is only because of his thing, and he got a Nobel Prize, not for, not for relativity. He got a, a very simple experiment, photoelectric effect. And the reason for that is that he learned, understood how to put electronics together and so on. And he did that experiment. He was an experimentalist at one time. Okay. Feynman was an experimentalist at one time. In thin film, of, uh, all the film. He was hired as a young student in a company which is plating nickel and so on. And he found that if he changes the current density, change the pH value of the electrolyte, the color changes, the nickel, nickel film dip, look different. And he surmised even at that time, there's something happening here in that thing. So, so it's not, there's nothing crime, crime, okay. 
So, concluding remark really is that we have to recognize that knowledge and innovation are important for academic institutions. But we need radical reforms in our governance, our management, our accountability, and so on. And we have to, essentially, we have to mandate institutions to create an ecosystem for integration of the culture of knowledge-based innovation and start thinking, break the barriers between departments and centers. Let students go wander in different departments. Let a group of students produce something together. There should be no restriction from, uh, and, and even IITs won't allow, I can assure you that. Electrical engineer is not allowed to go to computer science to do a project, unless you are a strong director. And I, I happen to be a strong director, okay, and the students would come crying to me. And I, I said, my order is very clear here. You can do a project anywhere in the, in the, in the, in the, in the institute. But even that is not acceptable. You know, electronics, electrical, and computer, they used to be together 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Today they are split up like India and Pakistan. They don't want to talk to each other. This is happening in IITs. So I can imagine what happens in you know, I think we have to break those barriers, particularly young fellows. It's just a challenge here. You should say that you know what you are today. You know what you are studying today. But you do not know what you will be in 10 years. You may be a chemical engineer. You may be a physicist, a chemist. Who knows? You may be doing something entirely different. I, I think this is where the world is changing and that's why it's our responsibility in the universities in higher education to prepare our young people to be able to converge knowledge. They should think that it can be converged. Only thing they should know is where to find the knowledge. And I think again I'll cite the example of Einstein. Einstein obviously well known for relativity. Einstein was not a great mathematician. General theory of relativity is, is highly theoretical. But you know what he said? I don't care, I'm not a theoretician, I don't know mathematics, but I know where to find the mathematics. See, he took mathematics and Riemann and so on, he used it very, so, so I think this is what we are supposed to teach, how to find, where to find and then use it. So it is not necessary to, to teach all the physics that we can till MSc or all the chemistry, all the biology, we should be teaching them so that they learn to learn, where to find it. I think that's the curiosity we have to do that. And if Einstein could do it, I'm sure you young fellows keep that in mind. Uh, don't think of that, I want to be a physicist only, or I want to be a computer scientist only. As I said, you don't know what you will be in 10 years or 15 years. So please keep that in mind, that what is, the institution should, should give you that provision for that, okay? Okay, and finally, I think, uh, oh, I, th I think this is something I, you know, ironically, as I said, we have written a lot of uh, documents our constitution says something which I don't know whether, have you, have you ever heard of this, what our Indian constitution says? Our, our people who wrote the constitution, our forefathers were very intelligent and this is obviously due to people like Ambedkar or, or even Jawaharlal Nehru. You know he said, this is the constitution says, it shall be the fundamental duty of every citizen to develop scientific temper, spirit of inquiry and reform. This is what we did. But we have forgotten, as I said, we are, we are still learning where the key is. We, we wrote it, but we don't know where the key is to find. And uh, uh, so we continue with that. And, and I think finally, if you don't mind, I've written an ode to Knowledge Republic. This is my ode, not a very good English, uh, not a very good poetic English. But knowledge is the new God. Knowledge centers are the temples. Knowledge faithfuls are innovators. Knowledge driven innovators, innovations are the offerings. Knowledge leaders are the gurus. And entrepreneurial gurus exploit innovation to create wealth for the society. And I hope in this knowledge republic, particularly the young people, they have a responsibility. They will make it a India as a true knowledge republic. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your inspiring lecture. And I'm sure everyone sitting here who take a point home to be innovative and create a knowledge-based society. We have thrown light on how important innovation is and how entrepreneurship can be developed through innovation and a good knowledge society. How entrepreneurship can be created and inter interdisciplinary as well as collective activities could be had in higher education institutions. A famous historian says, the foundation of every state is the education of youth. And sir, you have told us how we need to 
train our youth to build a progressive society and a prosperous nation. Thank you very much for your uh, inspiring lecture and we are all inspired and hope we all carry home a point saying that we would adhere to your points of building a knowledge-based society. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have Padma Sri Professor K.L. Chopra, Amisas, who delivered such an inspiring lecture, keeping us all attentive for more than one and a half hours through which he has taken us through a session where we, we derive how do we build a knowledge-based society through innovations, through entrepreneurship, through research and development for a holistic society. As a token of our gratitude, we would like to honor our guest for coming over here and sharing his experience with us. I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to, fe to felicitate Professor K.L. Chopra. Sir, I request you to kindly accept our felicitations. function is our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Bhairappa, who himself is a scientist and researcher of repute. This is the first Foundation Day lecture since Professor K. Bhairappa has taken over as the Vice Chancellor of Mangalore University. May I request you, sir, to kindly address the gathering as the President of this function. Good afternoon to all of you. My esteemed friend, Professor Padmasri, Kasturiel Chopra, the guest of uh, today, and the other dignitaries on the stage, my colleagues from the administration, Professor B. Narayan and Professor Pakirappa, my esteemed colleagues, teaching, non-teaching, the invitees, students, and the media community present in this August audience. I would like to first congratulate the students, teachers, and the non-teaching staff of this university as a mark of completing 34 years, the university is 34 years now, and this is my first Foundation Day address. Before I start my presidential remarks, I would like to pay respect and remember all those who have contributed for the establishment of this great university way back in 1980. My special pranam to late Sri U.T. Farid, Professor Shekali, the first Vice Chancellor of this uh, university, and also the other political leaders of this region, Sri Virappa Maili, and also the then Chief Minister, or Gundu Rao, who were responsible for the establishment of this uh, university. As I mentioned on the Teachers' Day occasion, that um, it is also considered as a great festival wherein festival of the university wherein all the students, teachers and non-teaching staff participate in celebrating this foundation day, remembering the 
people who have contributed to this in establishing this university and people who have achieved or who have come out as great achievers from this university. And also I would like to say this as an occasion of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, the reason is if not those people, this university would not have been a reality. So that is why it's a kind of thanksgiving festival to all those who are responsible for the establishment of this great educational institution which is located in this beautiful picturesque Western Ghats and the coastal region of the country which has the highest number of educational institutions, universities, although Mangalore is a small city compared to Bangalore or Mumbai or M Delhi, the city has many universities and the highest number of educational institutions, engineering colleges, dental colleges, pharmaceutical colleges, medical colleges and so on. So the region, you can call it, has an education hub in the country. So in this competitive world where education is seen or considered as one more marketing commodity and I am sure that uh, Professor Chopra in his uh, Foundation Day lecture has opened the eyes of all of us uh, how innovation, how the knowledge and how entrepreneurship can transform the society and the nation and the national economy. So the knowledge has to be transformed to technology. This is what uh, you know, the essence of his uh, talk, innovation, giving knowledge, knowledge to the technology. The entrepreneurship he mentioned, yes, it should be you know, promoted in the universities. In fact, I am negotiating with a company to introduce this as one of the elective subjects under this choice-based credit system. Students can opt for this uh, entrepreneur architecture or enterprise architecture. Professor Chopra mentioned, taking the example of uh, Cambridge University, which has the largest number of uh, industries around the campus. Yes, most of the universities abroad survive through the funding from these companies. I have experienced this during my stay because my existence was supported in many universities by the companies only, by the corporates, because we were doing a lot of work to these companies being within the university. They were coming to us for solutions. This has to be promoted. I will give one good example of what I have seen at the Penn State University at uh, the University Park. Myself and Professor Chopra had a common friend, a great chemist of U.S., an Indian origin, Professor Rustum Roy. When he started his career at Penn State University, he opened a corporate at the university and it became a money earning, I would say even spinning corporate in the university, meeting the requirements of the financial uh, requirements of the finance of the Penn State University and he sold that university, I mean that uh, corporate uh, to another private company and university earned 
millions and millions of dollars through that. So why I'm telling this is we, it's time, high time that um, the faculty members should be encouraged to take up the entrepreneurship and also link, establish link with the industries. In one of the meetings uh, very recently while inaugurating a workshop in the electronics department, I mentioned in my inaugural address that we should invite the company people not only to deliver some special lectures to our students but also to take up ad adjunct professorship that would help the university in the long run. And I did announce in the chairperson's meeting that we should collaborate with the industries and also support the industries with whatever the facilities we have through consultancy and earn the money and majority of the money or at least 50% of the money should go to the faculty and the remaining 50% can be you know paid to the university so this is what I am you know looking at not taking all you know the money to the university we should also motivate the faculty members to have the link with uh, the industries. This would encourage the faculty to look towards the industries. One of my friends in England, he has a company, he is a professor at Nottingham University. He teaches at Nottingham, but he has his own company very close to the university and he funds the projects within the university from his company. He organizes the conferences, meetings, and he supports all those paying from his company. So such a culture should come in our country also. Now, I would like to say a few words on this auspicious day. We have to take this university to greater heights through commitment, accountability, and bringing more and more funding from the funding agencies and from the other industries, from industries, and increase the student enrollment and start new innovative programs which are relevant to the local requirements and also the national requirements. We should showcase our strength the strength of this university by organizing open house that would really attract the students enrollment and also showcase your strength by organizing the conferences and invite the dignitaries from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Encourage students not only on the curricula activities but also extracurricular activities and also create a congenial atmosphere, harmony on the campus, create or introduce creativity in the minds of students, encourage students to take up the extension activities, show or teach or introduce vision and mission of this university in the minds of the students. Introduce discipline, dedication, devotion in students and show them the direction. Professor Chopra also mentioned in his talk the teacher today is only a facilitator. We have to tell the student what is good, what is bad, in which direction we should go. He also quoted a beautiful example, example of Einstein who was not very good in mathematics. In fact, the mathematics teacher in the school where Einstein was studying in Zurich, he did tell Einstein, I don't want to see your face in my class. You, 
must be out from my class if at all I have to teach in this class. That is how Einstein was treated. But the same Einstein, a great theoretician which involved a lot of mathematics, he knew from where to get the mathematics. This is what our teachers have to do to show the students where they should go to get the best. And in fact the cross-border discipline, you know, the studies related to the other subjects or depending on the interests of the students, this should be encouraged within our university. I will give my own example. At one time, I was not allowed to enter the physics department or chemistry department or biotech or microbiology department. Although, immediately after my return from the Soviet Union in 1983, I introduced interdisciplinary, I practiced, I would say, interdisciplinary research. So I was not allowed to go into these departments. But I set an example. The students from all those departments, the faculty from all those departments, and students from the engineering colleges, they came to my lab. And I encouraged all of them to pursue their research in my laboratory. So that is what we should do here in this university also. The teachers should take their profession as a, a challenging one. And the best way to do that is introduce uh, the dissertation projects and motivate the students for research at the PG level itself and encourage them to visit your research labs and take them to the field work and extension activities and all that. So from next year I would like to celebrate this Foundation Day as a festival by honoring the best performers of our university like particularly for the students and alumni, students and alumni from this university, the student who has scored highest marks, for example, from all you know, the departments in the PG courses, and uh, the best uh, you know, athlete, maybe from the national, uh, at the national level, or the national award winner, maybe you know, an alumni, so we should invite them here and honor them. So let us celebrate our Foundation Day from next year onwards by honoring the best performers of, uh, from our university. So I request all of you to work collectively to take this university to greater heights and with the new advanced science center coming up at Belapu and also the fast growing uh, developing PG center at Chikaluwara in Madikeri district and also the proposed evening college in Mangalore at Ampanakate in our university college and also the proposal to start a new degree college in Konaje and to start uh, the foreign language courses from next year. All these things I am sure that with your cooperation and help and encouragement we can take this Mangalore University to the national limelight. And I would like to bring Mangalore University Vision 2030 document by next Foundation Day celebrations. So with these few words, I would like to thank all of you and my special thanks to Professor Kasturi L. Chopra for accepting our invitation to deliver this Foundation lecture and let us follow his guidelines. He is known as a strong critic irrespective of the positions or the person to whom he is uh, talking. He talks in the same tone even with uh, big people like Abdul Kalam or Professor C. N. R. Rao. I have seen that. So that is why so he has a great uh, 
the respect in the scientific community, that respect can come only if you are a great academician. So that is how I think Professor Chopra is known as father of uh, thin film technology in the world. So with these uh, few words, I thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Pellergo Namaskara. Distinguished Chief Guest Padmasri, Professor Kasturi L. Chopra, former Director IIT Kharagpur, President of today's function and Vice Chancellor of Mangalore University, Professor K. Bhairappa, Research Evaluation, Professor Narayana, Syndicate and Academic Council members, teaching and non teaching staff, members from electronic and print media, invitees, and dear students. A very good afternoon to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to everyone present here on this auspicious occasion. At the outset, on behalf of Mangalore University and everyone present here, I express my deep sense of gratitude to our distinguished chief guest, Padma Sri Professor Dr. Kasuri L. Chopra, former director of IIT Kharagpur, for accepting our invitation and delivering Foundation Day Lecture 2014 on a very relevant, thought-provoking and emerging topic, nurturing innovation and entrepreneurship in academic institutions, which very aptly being selected for the higher education institutions. Thank you very much, sir. Professor, Professor K. Bhairappa is our 8th Vice Chancellor and took over the leadership of this university on 5th June 2014. Our beloved Vice Chancellor has a proven track record of profound scholarship, both at national and international levels, and is a great source of inspiration, encouragement, guidance, and motivation to all of us. He has been very kind enough to preside over today's Foundation Day Lecture 2014 and share his valuable experience and knowledge with all of us despite his hectic schedule of engagements. On behalf of everyone present here, let me thank very profusely our Honorable Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, sir. Professor B. Narayana, Register Evaluation, has given a very good introduction of the dignitaries and welcomed all of us on this occasion. Thank you so much, Professor Narayana. <laughs> Members of the Syndicate, Academic Council and other statutory bodies have enhanced the value of this celebration by their august presence. We are extremely thankful to all of you. Our friends from the electronic and print media have been continuously supporting our university activities by their participation. We sincerely thank on behalf of Mangalore University for wide and effective coverage of the program. Thank you. A lot of homework has gone into this program by the staff of administrative, teaching and engineering sections. Our heartfelt thanks are due to them. No function is a success without students and employees. They are our university ornaments. With pleasure, I thank all of them. Last but not the least, Professor A.M. Khan is a seasoned master of ceremony. Thank you, Professor Khan, for completing the program very aptly. Thank you all once again.